Hey guys, I'm Lisa. Welcome to Lisa Study Guides. Today we're going to be going through all the light we cannot see. And I'm going to put it out there. This is a personal favorite of mine out of all of the VCE English texts that are on the syllabus. This is definitely a topper. So I'm really excited to get through this and share with you some of the advice and tips I have, you know, kind of come away with it and can't wait to show you. So yeah. Also, I just wanted to put out there, you know, I do not claim to know how to speak German or French. So when it comes to doing the pronunciation for certain names, please just forgive me. I'm probably gonna, well, I'm, it's not probably, I'm highly likely that I'm gonna ruin them because of my Australian accent, but I'm sure you guys can forgive me. Let's get started. Background. All the light we cannot see parallels the stories of two young children to adulthood. Marty Law and Werner Fennig amongst the backdrop of World War II. Marie Law is a blind Parisian girl who has a close relationship with her widowed father, Daniel LeBlanc. Daniel is depicted as a loving, dedicated father who spends his spare time constructing a miniature wooden version of their city so that Marie Law can see Paris via touch and eventually be able to independently navigate her way around in real life. Daniel is also the principal locksmith of the city's National History Museum and it is here that Marty Law first learns a tale of the Sea of Flames, a beautiful but cursed diamond whose bearer has immortality, but at the cost of losing all those they love. The Sea of Flames is locked securely in the museum, so its supposed curse cannot harm people. When Paris falls to the Germans, Daniel and Marty Law flee to St. Malo, where her great uncle Etienne lives. Without her knowledge, Daniel secretly carries the treasured Sea of Flames previously stored at the National History Museum with the mission of protecting it from the Germans. The novel follows the disappearance of her father and the consequent defiance and rebellion against the Germans born from Marie Law, Etienne, Madame Manek and the people who live in their neighborhood. Meanwhile, Werner, an orphan, is raised at the children's house in Zolverein with his sister Jotta. He is intelligent and highly skilled repairing radios. His gift leads him to be accepted into the elite Nazi training school, Schulpforte, where children as young as eight are whipped into Nazi ideology. From there, we see the intense training the boys endure, the cruelty inflicted upon their enemies, and his sweet friendship with the gentle Frederick. Years later, his role is to hunt down those a part of the resistance movement who are using radios to communicate. As more and more innocent people are killed, we see Werner's conscience slowly override his ambition and ignorance. Werner and Marty Law only meet in the last few chapters of the novel, and even then, it is only a fleeting intersection of their lives. They are united in their ties with the radio and in those final moments, we see the humanity in both of these people. Themes choice versus fate. At the heart of all the light we cannot see, we learn how all people have the power to make choices, and the way people respond to situations is different. Madame Menek is at the forefront of their local rebellion, and it is her and her friends who create a secret resistance group united in St. Malo. We see how our own choices have consequences, and in this case, Madame Menek's rebellion influences Etienne to join the resistance after her death. In a similar vein, Daniel preaches to Mori Law to reject supernatural forces. There are, he assures her, no such thing as curses. There is luck maybe, bad or good, a slight inclination of each day towards success or failure, but no curses. And it is with this mindset that she walks the path of logic. Every outcome has a cause and every predicament has a solution. Every lock, it's key. When trapped in her home with Von Rumpel, Rather than adopting the view that she is fated to die, she relies on reason and logic to navigate the darkness and find her way to safety. This is in stark contrast to Werner, who merely accepts his fate when trapped in the Hotel of Bees cellar. It is only when he is so close to death does he slowly begin to realize that in the end, it was him himself who pretended there were no choices. Werner, who watched Frederick dump the pail of water at his feet, I will not. Werner, who stood by as the consequences came raining down. Werner, who watched Volkheimer wade into house after house, the same ravening nightmare recurring over and over and over. His supposed lack of free will results in the killing of an innocent child and her mother, which will haunt his conscience forever. 
Yet despite Werner submitting to the Reich's propaganda, his escape from the ruins of the cellar is almost a second chance, a new beginning for Werner as he finally makes a choice of his own volition to save Marie Law. The Inhumanity of Violence Throughout the novel, human procedures in the war are reduced to mechanic metaphors. To be at the forefront of the war means that it is absolutely necessary for the men to discard their humanity and replace that with an intoxicated state where they could ward off a vast and inevitable tidal wave of anguish only by staying forever drunk on rigor and exercise and gleaming boot leather. This stealing of your body is what enables Werner to perform his role tracing and destroying enemy radio transmitters. And this stealing of the soul is even more important for Volkheimer, who, for being the instrument, the executor of the orders, the blade of the right, heals the radio operators. This last quote is revealing of how these men were treated during the war, not as human beings, but as tools for the powerful to manipulate and whip into action. Contrastingly, weapons are personified with in the first few pages of the novel, demonstrating how much power has been given to these weapons, making them larger than life. The men tend to machines the way worker bees tend to a queen. They fed her oils, repainted her barrels, lubricated her wheels, they've arranged sandbags at her feet like offerings. Weapons are like the queen bees during World War II, worshipped and treated far better than the men themselves, who survive on minimal rations and extremely cold conditions. Contrastingly, incendiary rounds are dropped into the mouths of mortars, as though the weapons need feeding and are portrayed as in much healthier conditions than the men as machinery hums. Ironically, Werner is stationed at the Hotel of Bees, a very fitting name for the fortress to hold the bee workers of World War II. Symbolically, it is when the hotel is destroyed that we see Werner completely strip away his alliance to the Germans. He's no longer a bee working for a queen. Tips. So let me leave you with a few tips that I think will be incredibly helpful for you. This is a really big book. I understand it's over 500 pages. So I'm sure there are people out there who are feeling like they're just not going to get through it. And it's just such a huge book. But I think that it's a really powerful book and it's such an enjoyable read if you can just get through the initial part. So you'll find that the writing itself is extremely verbose and highly descriptive. So that's one thing that you need to get used to to begin with. I found that as I was reading the book, I wasn't able to read it fast because the words are so heavy and so loaded with descriptive vocabulary. So be aware that it's going to take you some time to get through the actual reading, the actual sentences themselves. And I think once you get used to that certain pace, you'll be all right for the rest of it. Now, the first few chapters are just to set the scene. So you're going to see that the first few chapters themselves, which are only like one page pretty much for each chapter, are just there to help you set the scene and they're in the present. Then from part one, 1934, we move back in time and we start exploring Mori Law and Werner's lives from when they were children and as they grow up. So what you will then find, it's going to alternate between Werner and Mori Law. If you're somebody who struggles to read books, then I would suggest that you digest one chapter at a time. I think that the chapters themselves are quite short, so that actually makes getting through a book a lot easier because you're doing it in snack sized chunks. The other thing that I want to leave you to think with is basically the narrative structure. So it's written from an omniscient third person narrator, so basically somebody who's watching in on these people's lives. But think about the shifts between Werner and Mori Law's perspective and then why sometimes you have introductions of other people. So Volkheimer, Daniel, Etienne, Jutta. Why do we have those and what is the significance of them? What do their stories show us? So I'm going to leave it there for you today. But if you needed any more help, then we've actually created a study guide blog post on this particular book. So I'm going to link that up in the cards up above for you. What you can do with this blog post is actually download it and save it as a PDF so you can use it as you're studying. It goes through, you know, in a lot more detail, some of the stuff that I've covered today, including themes, quotes, literary devices, and analysis. And as a bonus, 
If you scroll all the way down to the bottom of the blog post, you will find a free text response mini guide where we go through how to break down a prompt, how to structure an essay and how to write it up. So that's all free for you. So go ahead and check it out and I'll see you guys next time.